there's going to be a victory of the offspring of the woman through conflict, right? Because the serpent will crush the heel of the offspring of the woman. And we think of, uh, you know, this is picked up in Romans 16, 20, isn't it? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Well, clearly, he's thinking of Genesis 3.15, isn't he? The, the illusion there is quite clear. Or, yeah, I think another text that has this in mind is when Paul says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say into seeds as though referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed who is Christ. Is ultimately the ultimate offspring of Genesis 3.15, of course, is Jesus himself. He's the, he's the fulfillment of that promise. So, human beings are either, so we, we have a storyline set up here. Human beings are either the offspring of the woman or the offspring of the serpent. Everybody's born into the world as the offspring of the serpent, only by regeneration. But this, this gets picked up in Scripture, doesn't it? Jesus is telling us the parable of the, the wheat and the tares. And he says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. These are the offspring of the woman. The weeds are the children of the evil one. They're the offspring of the serpent, aren't they? So, let me see one example of that. Another one, John 8, 44. Uh, what does Jesus say to these people? You are, the fa you are of your father the devil. So, uh, by the way, at ETS a few years ago, John, Gerald Bray, do you know that name, Gerald Bray? Gerald Bray and I had a debate more discussion on his systematic theology and my biblical theology, and he didn't like that I said some pe the people are the offspring of the serpent or the offspring of the woman, and he said, I don't see that in Scripture. But I just pointed to these verses. I said, hey, you're, you're, you are of your father the devil. Um, the, um, uh, clearly, it's an allusion to Genesis 3.15, I'd say. You want to carry out your father's desires. So, when Cain and Abel come into the world, Abel is, at some point is regenerated. But 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 here's here's the point: Cain, Cain is the Cain is the offspring. Cain is the the offspring of the devil. He, he he's on the serpent side, and and Abel's of the offspring of the woman. And so we see the battle of the seeds. You know, and, and, and I want to say that conflict's still going on, right? It's going on in Los Angeles. It's going on everywhere. There's a conflict going on between the children of the, of, of, of the woman and the children of the serpent. What a, Abel, Abel offers a sacrifice that, to God that's accepted, and uh, that's quite interesting. Genesis 4, Abel's sacrifice was accepted Maybe because, in part because he offered the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. You know, fat was very important for the Hebrews, wasn't it? You, a very, um, even today, right? You know, a ribeye steak, it's so good because of the fat in it, right? So that's what makes it good. So the fat portions are very special. So we have a little hint that he offered the best, Right? Although it sounds a little bit like as well as Abel accepted because of his works, but then when we read in Hebrews, we see that by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. It isn't the, the text doesn't argue that Cain Cain sinned because he offered uh, didn't offer animals, which some people have said historically, but it doesn't say that. I mean, after all, Cain was a farmer. But 
we're told finally that it came to have faith. And Abel did have faith. And so, so Cain's, Abel's faith, and so here's a key theme of biblical theology, right? Abel's faith caused him to do good works, didn't it? But the root, what's the root? The root is his faith. The root is his trust in God. His trust in God led him to behave in a certain way. So Hebrews is a hermeneutical lens by which we interpret Genesis 4, right? This is an inspired commentary on what happened in Genesis. Because you could read Genesis and just think, well, Abel just did the right thing. Genesis says nothing about his motivations in doing it. But Hebrews tells us what the motivation was. And the motivation was he was trusting in God. So that's a very, a very important thing to see. That's, that's the reason Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain, of course, Cain puts to death, Cain puts to death um, Abel because the offspring of the serpent, they always want to destroy the offspring of the woman. Don't they? Of course. When Jesus is born, when Jesus is born, what does Herod want to do? <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> because Herod is the offspring of the serpent. And that's what the offspring of the serpent always want to do. They always want to put to death the people of God. Ultimately, I'm not saying that every unbeliever is consciously thinking today of killing you. <laughs> but it would get that way eventually, given the right circumstances. So Cain's motive is his jealousy. So then as the story develops, you have the Cainites versus the Sethites. Who are the Cainites? They're the children of the serpent. Who are the Sethites? They're the children of God, right? The, children, the offspring of the woman. And then you have the sons of God and the daughters of men. And uh, Klein says there's an ever-growing avalanche of sin. So that's a very, very disputed passage, who the sons of God are. Um, at Clifton Baptist Church, where I'm one of the elders, and I served as the pastor for 17 years, we put this in our statement of faith. No one can join our church unless they hold to our view of sons of God. I'm kidding again, <laughs> right? So uh, it's a... I had a, when I, I went to Western Seminary in Portland for my MDiv, and I took a class in Old Testament theology, and the professor gave us 13 different views on who the sons of God are. And now for the rest of the day, I'm going to go through those 13 views. So, no, we're not going to do that. I actually think the sons of God are demons. But many people disagree with that. Uh, incidentally, uh, I'm just going to tell you a couple things. That was the unanimous view in Jewish tradition. That is, if you read Second Temple Jewish literature, they all held that view. I think that's what Jude verse 6 is talking about. I think that's what 1 Peter 3, when he talks about the spirits in prison, is talking about. Uh, I think 2 Peter 2, that's what it's talking about as well. You know, it's, it's very big in the book of 1 Enoch, and Jude even quotes 1 Enoch, you know. So, uh, you know, it's not that important of an issue, is it? My very good friend, uh, Wayne Grudem, you all know that name, I'm sure. Wayne and I have been friends for years. Wayne's very strong that it can't be that. And I respect that view enormously. I, I mean, I love Wayne to death. He's an inspiration to me in so many ways. He's, he's just the greatest. I taught at Phoenix Seminary, the, was it last year or a year and a half ago? And we had dinner over at Wayne and Margaret's house. They're just so, so wonderful. I've known Wayne for years. And he argues it's the, uh, those during the generation of Noah. So that could be, you know, you, you make up your mind on that. It's not a, not a crucial issue. You know, the big objection to it being demons is demons, uh, demons can't have sex, right? I mean, they're having sex in this chapter. But what is my response to that? My response to that is when demons come to earth, they come to earth as men every time. And, 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 uh, and, and we see in Genesis 18, they, they come... Uh, they come, including the angel of the Lord, two angels and the angel of the Lord come to Abraham, and they have lunch. Well, they really have lunch. They don't say we're angels, thanks for the food, and then throw it over their shoulders. That was nice. Thanks for the piece of meat. We don't eat, actually. We're angels. They ate it. So when angels come to earth, they, they come as human beings. And uh, I'm writing a book on this, angels and eating and sex. It should sell. 
<laughs> you know, my books aren't selling the way I want, and you know, kind of like, this is the key to the whole Bible, and so forth and so on. But anyway, obviously we're going to leave that behind because it's not that important. Whatever your view, and whatever your view, things are going bad, right? So, so Genesis 6, by the time we get to Genesis 6, what's, what's going on in the story? What's going on in the story is the seed of the serpent are winning. They're not just winning, they're trouncing the offspring of the woman. It, it, it's not even close, is it? Noah... Noah is, is righteous and blameless per Psalm 15, but he's, he's isolated. Isn't it interesting when 1 Peter picks it up? So I love to see these canonical links. When 1 Peter picks it up, 1 Peter is written right to a suffering church. And what does 1 Peter say? There's eight, eight righteous people in the whole world. I mean, do, we, do I feel like a minority sometimes? Do I think things aren't going in a good direction in our country? I, I, I feel that. I feel, I feel more out of sync with where things are going. But look at this room. <laughs> in this room, we have, what, five times what Noah enjoyed. That's just this room, you know? And uh, we're not so isolated. We may be suffering. We may be persecuted. But we're not in Noah's situation. Uh, so uh, I, I like... Right, but let me just say this. Why is the story told this way? I think this is such a good reminder. Because we're, the story is told this way to remind us that um, the power of human sin is enormous. The sinfulness of all, our own hearts. So, so let's get personal. The sinfulness of my heart is far greater than I know. And, and you too. I am far more selfish than I recognize. I just, I just see little glimpses of it as a Christian, right? I, I do, this Holy Spirit does reveal our sin, but not the fullness of it. The, 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 the evil in human hearts is, is massive. The evil in your heart is massive. That's why we needed a Redeemer who would die for our sins. So it's a huge thing, isn't it? And this is why we have such a big problem sharing the gospel with people. Why? Because... We're not so bad. <laughs> oh, come on! It's not so bad. We we, we don't need we don't need uh, we don't need to save. I I uh, by the way, I, a few years ago, I had a debate in Columbia, Missouri, with a, a Muslim and a Unitarian and me. So uh, and uh, the 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 Muslim he was not a jihadist type Muslim. Not surprisingly, right? I don't think they'd bother to even debate me. But his his basic thing was. Hey, if you're a dad and your kids sin, you just forgive them, and that's what God does. You do something bad, you do something bad, what, God, what does God do? Say, He says, I forgive you. I mean, come on. He doesn't have to send his son to die for us. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, he just loves us and forgives us. And, 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 and guess what? Everybody out there who is, uh, this Holy Spirit wasn't working in their hearts, what do you think they thought? They thought, of course. Of course, of course. That's what dads do. Dads forgive their kids. God forgives those sinners. It's not that big a deal, is it? So, you know, you see the view of sin in that, right? It's not that big a deal. Yeah, you're, you're, it's okay. You're forgiven. You don't have to send it. You don't have to send your son. Of course, he didn't believe God had a son. You don't have to send a son to die for sin. So the story tells us the greatness of sin. Abraham Heschel says, God's judgment is not a blind, explosive force operating without reference to the behavior of man, but rather voluntary and purposeful, motivated by concern for right and wrong. So, um, you know, if you've read the Greek myths, you know, I've, I've done some reading in the Greek myths, maybe you have too. The gods in the Greek myths are just capricious and selfish and whimsical and you know, they, they, they explode with bad temper when they're just personally affronted. And what Heschel is saying here, our God is holy, isn't he? He's a holy God. His judgment is, is a righteous judgment. So, by the way, let me just say, if you're thinking of your schedule in here, I'll probably usually do a break at 9.30. We'll probably do a break. Maybe quarter to 11, we'll do another one.
you know, so we'll have two breaks in here every morning. I, I think that sounds good because we, we need some breaks if you're thinking, are we having any breaks? Yeah, we'll have some. So, um, so uh, we have a reestablishment. We have the reestablishment with Noah of the covenant with Adam. Now, not everybody thinks that what you have with Adam is a covenant. I, I think there is a covenant there uh, with Adam. I, I, I mean, not everybody holds that view, obviously. You know, perhaps the Ark of Noah is like the tabernacle where God's presence resides. Is it significant that the word Ark is used? Like the Ark of the Covenant? Now, we've got to be careful there. But I think it... I don't want to be dogmatic on that, but I lean that direction. God's presence is in the ark with his people. So we, we don't want to go to allegory, but sometimes we're too restrictive too. You can be too expansive, but you can also be too restrictive. We have many things that lead us to think we have a covenant, I think, like a covenant with Adam. There are many parallels. So the original creation was out of water, and so the new creation, right, after Noah, the earth's covered with water and God recreates the world. And he separates the water, right? Remember the earth is covered in Genesis 1-2 with water. He separates the water so dry land can appear. Birds, animals, and creeping things are brought in to swarm upon the earth. Well, that's what happened in the original creation. And of course, that's happens again, of course, they come out of the ark with Noah. God establishes days and seasons again, right? I mean, so, Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease, so he reestablishes the seasons. That's very helpful. I, isn't that interesting? As long as the earth endures, that'll happen. Animals are commanded to be fruitful and multiply, but that's what we saw before. Human beings are to be, fruit, are to, to be fruitful and multiply. Human beings are to rule the world for God. That's what Adam and Eve were to do. All right, Genesis uh, 9, 2. Yeah, so everything's under... All, all, all creation is placed under human authority. God provides food for human beings. Of course, there's a change, right? Now we can eat meat, you know? You don't have to eat meat, do you? But every once in a while, I run across Christians, very rarely, but who think it's wrong to eat meat. And I just say, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to eat meat, but I'm having meat, personally. I like it. And God says we can have it. The image of God is still in man. Right? The image isn't withdrawn. God made humans in his image. I'll come back to that verse in a minute. Peter Gentry argues that it's a renewal of the covenant with Adam because you have the language of establishing the covenant, instead of cutting the covenant. So if you know Hebrew, kum, instead of karat, establishing kum. And Gentry argues that when you have the language, when you have kum used, establishing, confirming a covenant, instead of karat, cutting a covenant, that you have a, a reestablishment of a covenant that's been made. I, I mean, I've looked at the evidence. I think it works 95% of the time. I, Peter is my colleague, and we are dear friends, and he's a, he's a great guy. And, you know, if he were here, he'd give you another point of view. But I, I, I don't think it's quite as locked down as he does. <laughs> but I think it's probably right uh, in, in this case. You know, is it 100% right in every case? I'm not sure of that. So a covenant, a covenant is made. What, what's the... Humans are preserved. What's this covenant about? Humans are preserved in history, so God's redemptive plan will be fulfilled. So God starts over. You know, so sometimes you think, why don't we just start over? Well, we've, it, it's happened. 
<laughs> there has been a start over. <laughs> There's already been a start over. Let's just start again. But, but it, so you have the covenant with Adam reestablished, but there's a difference. And what's the difference? The difference is Noah's a sinner, right? You know, what, what's the problem with human beings? When the Lord saw, why was there a flood? When the Lord saw that the human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every, this is such a verse, isn't it? Every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Huh. That, is, that is remarkable. Genesis 8, 21. I will never again curse the ground because of human beings, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. That problem hasn't been solved. <laughs> That's different from Adam and Eve in the garden, right? They weren't sinners. So the covenant's reestablished, but there's a huge problem. That's sin. So I say the main difference between Noah and Adam, we have no return to paradise. Noah is like, and Noah, like Adam, sins in a garden. Isn't that interesting? He gets drunk. A different sin, but he's in a garden and he sins. So I, I think the narrator is telling us, look, the fundamental problem is there. Noah's a godly man, and yet, yet there's a problem. Rain, the rainbow is a sign and seal of God's promise. I agree with those who say the, the, we, the, the word there is a bow, God's bow of war, right? By which he's going to slay the people who's withdrawn. He's, he's not going to destroy human beings. So I understand this covenant to say not only that the world won't be destroyed by water, but the human race will survive, well, I think it's pretty obvious, right, until God's purposes are fulfilled. I mean, it's already happened, right, because the world could end today, right, and that promise is already fulfilled. God, God's, God's not going to wipe out the human race without fulfilling his redemptive purposes. That's the promise of this covenant. And government was given to deter evil. What do you do with the raging evil in human hearts? Well, you have God's given a means to have some kind of order to restrain human evil. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed, for God made humans in his image. Whoever kills a person with malice aforethought, right? Whoever kills a person with malice aforethought, that person is to be put to death. If they did it with malice aforethought and it can be demonstrated, the evidence is there, that person is to be put to, put to death because they've killed someone, they've murdered someone, that's a better word than killed, they've murdered someone made in God's image. I, th I think because the, the four clause, that that still applies today. Because the argument is a transcultural argument, right? Referring to something that is constitutive of human nature, made in God's image. And that's, it's not part of the Mosaic Covenant. So I think, I, think, I think the grounding is such that that's the command for today. I taught a D-Men class at Bethel years ago, and I had a student in there. We were actually talking about Romans. And I think Romans reappropriates this. The government doesn't bear the sword in vain. And I think the sword there is a reflection on this verse. And, uh, but a person in the class said, well, we ought not to do that. We ought not to exercise capital punishment because the person who's being put to death in capital punishment is made in God's image. Interesting argument, isn't it? We ought not to kill the person who murdered because the person who killed is made in God's image. And I just said to him, well, you know what? That's a really good argument. My problem with it is that's not the argument the text makes. The text makes a different argument. Because human beings are so valuable, you ought to kill them. <laughs> so I said, I can't follow you. I mean, your argument is logical. I understand it. It makes sense to me. If it weren't for the biblical text, I might even believe it. But you reverse what the text says. The text says the opposite of what you say. So what's our authority here? Your kind of creative solution? 
which was creative and interesting, because there's lots of smart people in the world, lots of people smarter than me and you, right? But people come up with, I've been a Christian a long time, I've been around a lot of smart people, a lot of people a lot smarter than I am, but I just say, show me. Show me that that's what the text is really saying. I'm, I'm wide open, but people have all kinds of reasons why, you know what, really when it's talking about hell, there's really no hell. But they stray. You know, I, I mean, a person I taught at Bethel just sent me a whole uh, book he's working on on how everybody's going to get a second chance <laughs> after they die, which I think is not true. So anyway, so why don't I open it up for questions or comments? Anything you want to say of what we've talked about so far? If you don't, if you don't have a question, that's fine, but I'd like to give you a chance. Just on this in 9.6, is it significant that the Lord brings out this now after the flood and not when Cain kills his brother? Yeah. Why, 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 does he, why does he wait until this point to say, make that statement? I think, it's, I, I think it's because of the... Um, one, one can see the full ramifications of sin. It's worldwide, society-wide. Is it, is it just Cain? And a few people like him. No, the, the infection is, it's through the whole system. The evil in human hearts is massive. I, I think that's why. Okay? Okay, I'll keep going for a few minutes. Um, but don't, don't be shy if you have a question. You, and by the way, you can disagree with me. Don't be shy about that. I've taught for years. Lots of people have disagreed with me. And I'm just happy to tell you you're wrong. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, you know, that's the way it is. Humans, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to tell you some stories, but I'm, we gotta stay on things. So human beings are scattered. Uh, that's our next evil offspring begin to multiply again. Okay, you start over, yeah, things aren't much better. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Things are still collapsing. So you have the Tower of uh, Babel, probably a ziggurat to reach heaven, right? We were, uh, we were uh, our son is a worker. Don't tweet us. Uh, our son is a worker in uh, Ras al Khaimah, the United Arab Emirates. We were there, our third son. We were there in uh, October, and uh, we went to the, what's the name of that building? Do you remember? The Burj Al Khalif or something like that. Anyway, it's the tallest building in the world. I don't know if you've been there in Dubai. Of course, and I mean, we went up, yeah, we, somebody gave us a gift to go up only halfway, though. It's too expensive, like hundreds of dollars to go to the very top. It's amazing, but it's sort of like that, right? What, you know, what do they want to say? Uh, we've got the tallest building in the world, and it is amazing, isn't it? Well, it's kind of like that. You know, this is what human beings can do. But, but, the, the, but the problem is, you know, what's the sin there? They want, they want to make a name for themselves. That's what the narrative says, right? They're trying to reach God's realm without God. And uh, that, that's, that, that's uh, we, we, we can, listen, we can have a just, beautiful, good, righteous, civil, caring society here in the United States, not just the United States, all over the world. We can do it without God. We can do it without God. It'll be fine. We can do that. You know, can't do. Hey, we're Americans, right? Um, we can do that. But, that. but that's actually the fundamental sin, isn't it? The fundamental sin is we can live life without God. We really don't need him. That's what Satan said to Adam and Eve. You don't need God. You'll be fine. You can do it on your own. On your own. And, uh, of course, we see that in Isaiah 14, which is about the king of Babylon, maybe about Satan as well, but at least... Clearly, it's about the king of Babylon. What does he say? You said to yourself, I'll ascend to the heavens. I'll set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount to the God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. There it is. So that's the fundamental sin, isn't it? Um, at the end of the day. So evil seems triumphant again. But God, God... God always rules. Evil never wins. Yeah, I didn't emphasize this enough, maybe, the flood, right? Sinners seem like 
You know, if you're eight, if there's eight godly people in the world, it's over, you know? It's over, but it's never over until it's over, right? If you watched the football game last night, I only saw the fourth quarter. I so wanted Alabama to lose. They always win. Why does Alabama always win? If you're an Alabama fan, forgive me for this little statement here. But anyway, I was like, yes, Georgia is ahead, 20 to 10, finally. I know Alabama lost last year, but they're going to lose. But of course, they came back, right? You know, and I'm not comparing Alabama to God, but you know, <laughs> so, but the but the the righteous finally win. You know, I mean, it was it was it was kind of an amazing comeback to watch. You know, you you guys are busy students; you don't watch football games, right? But um, I only watched the fourth quarter, so I was out with somebody. But th- that's the way it seems like evil is going to win, but 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 it's not going to win, right? God, God judges at the flood. He judges at the Tower of Babel. He scatters, scatters the human race. And, and we sort of see now, don't we, as we, well, we're still scattered, aren't we? But we see as the human race comes together more, the danger is, the danger is that evil becomes concentrated, right? We join all together. You think, oh, and, and there's still this illusion in people's mind. You know, if we could just all get together and we just have one, one system together, then we can have a just, wonderful society, you know? Well, you know, if anybody paid attention to the 20th century, you know what happens, whether it was communism or, or the Nazis or whatever. It, doesn't, it isn't a just society. Evil, evil breaks out. 